Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, NJ Transit's on-time performance. NJ Transit hits the mark and wins a two-year extension to finish installing positive train control. But what does that mean for commuters? Democratic legislative leaders cancel a vote on their controversial redistricting plan in the face of strenuous opposition. The last voting session for state lawmakers in 2018, they get to New Jersey Transit, but not marijuana legalization for adults, nor the $15 minimum wage. Plus, New Jersey's just doubled its number of medical marijuana dispensaries. Is there one close to home? And the Holland Tunnel's misplaced Christmas tree shifting left because the public demanded it be right. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. <laughs> from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Positive news on NJ Transit's deployment of positive train control. It came as great news to the governor, if not necessarily to the riding public. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. <laughs> NJ Transit canceled 10 trains this morning to commuters' ongoing aggravation, but Governor Murphy found something real to celebrate today as the agency worked to meet federal deadlines for installing the positive train control safety system. It hit a major milestone. I am proud to announce the, that installation of positive train control in the required 282 locomotives and cab cars and wayside installations along 326 miles of track is now done. Yeah. An astonishing graphic shows how the agency went from 12 to 100 percent of its goals in the first year of the Murphy administration and met the 2018 deadline with only days to spare. A minor miracle managed only by taking multiple trains out of service, including the entire Atlantic City line. It was that or else. And what many of our customers may not know, in addition to facing significant daily fines for failing to meet our year-end requirements and damage to our reputation, there was a real possibility that we would not have been able to operate service on January 1st. Murphy again blamed the prior Christie administration that he said dragged the process interminably. I think dragged may be too charitable a verb. Commuter safety took a backseat to cronyism. Service and reliability were sacrificed for, frankly, no good reason. So what now? NJ Transit's got two more years to finish installing PTC on another 150 rail cars and then test the system. No telling when service on the AC line will resume. For now, riders will notice only incremental progress. It's not a magic moment. There isn't tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Are, are you going to have a, a dramatically... Different. Meanwhile, four locomotive engineer classes will graduate next year and hopefully ease cancellations due to staff shortages. But there's no guarantee those new engineers will work for NJ Transit, which pays less than the other commuter railroads in the region. And what we're doing is working to improve the graduation rate of those classes, certainly giving them the encouragement to work for transit. I don't necessarily think they'd come for the training we're offering if they didn't intend to work for us. So I'm very hopeful. The agency's looking to hire former Long Island Railroad Chief Ray Kenny as its rail operations VP, and funding remains a problem that Murphy needs to solve. And there's got to be a, a way that that operating expenses are paid for and, and not out of the capital monies of New Jersey Transit, and that there are enough capital money to uh, available to do the things that New Jersey Transit needs. On funding, I think Diane and I are having a broad transportation funding um, sit down this afternoon, and we're early stages on our budget. So it's too early to tell, but we didn't come this far to now walk away. So NJ Transit gets that extra two years to finish installing and testing positive train control, but its biggest challenge will be winning back the confidence of its customers. In Kearney, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News.
redrawing legislative district lines has become a potent political issue in New Jersey. And a constitu constitutional redistricting amendment, critics said smacked of gerrymandering, has been spiked by Democratic leaders. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. Not much happens on a Saturday night in state government, but this past Saturday night, Senate President Sweeney and Assembly Speaker Coughlin pulled the plug on their controversial redistricting plan. We pulled the bill, as I said. We, want, we listened to the, the people who testified at the hearing, and uh, uh, we want to make sure that if we do a bill, that we, we include some of the stuff that they had proposed. And we'll, you know, for right now, we, we thought it was, uh, I thought it was the best thing to do to, to take it down, and so we're not going to consider it. The plan would have asked voters to approve a constitutional amendment changing the composition of the commission that redraws legislative districts. Critics said it would have cemented Democratic control for years to come. Good government groups, mainly on the left, but also on the right, came out strongly against the plan. It even got national attention. Former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder came out against it in his role as a watchdog over gerrymandering. At a time when Republicans are being criticized for power plays in places like Wisconsin and Michigan, the New York Times editorialized over the weekend that New Jersey Democrats play power games too. I think the sponsors of this bill just uh, totally misread the opposition to it. Uh, not only the opposition come from nonpartisan groups like uh, folks like me, but also from within their own ranks. Um, I, I think they thought that the, the folks who are against this uh, on the Democratic side were just like allies of Phil Murphy and this was kind of an intra-party battle. What they found was these were real, real grassroots activist groups who just said, we're Democrats, we don't have to win like this. In fact, this is exactly the kind of thing we're fighting against nationwide. Governor Murphy was another opponent of the plan. He too portrayed it as a power grab by legislative leaders cooked up in a back room. Calling off the vote was the right thing to do, he said. I'm completely of the opinion that the voters ought to pick the legislators, and the legislators shouldn't be picking the voters. Uh, and that's what that plan that was just pulled back would have done. So does he see this as a victory? So I never took it personally when it was when it was raised, and I don't, I don't take it personally as a victory lap either. Republicans see withdrawing the bill as a victory. The Democrats, with this one-party rule, are taking extreme measures and they're getting pushback. And this is across the board. Not only were they not able to do th something that was so extreme because the media pushed back. No one supported it. This one party rule is dangerous to the people in New Jersey and New Jersey pushed back. The Democratic sponsors of the measure took this new setback in stride. Well, we've been working on it for several years. There were a number of groups that were supportive of the plan three years ago that they came up with uh, certain oppositions. So I remain open-minded as I always have been with any legislation that I propose and we'll figure that into the mix and we'll go forward. The assembly sponsor says a fair legislative map does not mean districts that are all 50-50. New Jersey is not a 50-50 state. It's not today and it wasn't in the 1980s under Tom Kane. And those maps have been a reflection of the will of those voters. So the rush to get a redistricting plan in place for next year has taken a big hit. It can still be done, but will require a three-fifths majority to get on the 2019 ballot, and that's no easy task. At the State House, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Just 24 hours before the closing of open enrollment for health insurance under the Affordable Care Act, another attempt to dismantle it, a federal judge in Texas late Friday struck down the entire Affordable Care Act on the grounds that its mandate requiring most Americans to buy health insurance is unconstitutional. Reacting in a tweet, President Trump called the ruling great news for America. The reaction in New Jersey? Ridiculous. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm told it is riddled with uh, inconsistencies. Uh, it's overreaching. Uh, I want to make sure everybody realizes, if you're watching, the Affordable Care Act is alive and well as we stand here, and God willing, it'll remain so. Well, the impact would be devastating uh, because about 900,000 New Jerseyans rely on the Affordable Care Act for their health coverage now, both in Medicaid and the marketplace. So that's 10 percent of the entire population of New Jersey could lose health care coverage. And that's sort of mind boggling. 
The Texas ruling is expected to be appealed swiftly, and many legal experts foresee the case reaching the U.S. Supreme Court. For now, the ACA stays in place. Those who've signed up for insurance for 2019 will remain insured. Still, the ruling had a direct effect on the business community. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, the court ruling on the ACA impacted Wall Street today as the stocks of many insurance companies performed even more poorly than the overall market. The stock market's correction continued with a vengeance today. Stocks extended Friday's loss with the Dow down another 507 points. Steep losses for the NASDAQ and S&P 500 as well. Investors have been nervous about a few things, including slowing global growth and trade issues, added to the worry list for this week, a meeting of the Federal Reserve and the potential for another interest rate hike. Johnson & Johnson stock fell again today after Friday's steep decline following a negative news story about its baby powder products. But in an effort to reassure its investors, J&J &J this afternoon said it would buy back $5 billion worth of its stock and that it stands by its financial guidance for the year. Since Reuters reported that J&J &J knew its products contained asbestos, the New Brunswick-based company has lost more than $50 billion in market value. J&J &J has strongly denied those allegations, calling the report false. While efforts to approve recreational marijuana use in New Jersey have stalled, the state's medical marijuana program continues to expand. The State Department of Health today picked six applicants seeking to open new medical marijuana dispensaries. They will be located in Patterson, Rahway, Phillipsburg, Ewing, Vineland, and Atlantic City. In all, the state reviewed 146 applications. Now, these applicants still have to pass background checks and meet other requirements before they open for business. Once they are up and running, the state would have 12 dispensaries, which should ease supply shortages for patients. There are now 38,000 participating in New Jersey's program. That includes 20,000 new patients this year. A superior court judge has ruled in favor of Jersey City in a legal dispute over its new payroll tax, which is designed to help fund the city's schools. On Friday, a judge denied the plaintiff's request for a temporary injunction that would have kept the city from implementing that new tax on January 1st. The plaintiffs, which include real estate developer Matt Kelly, had argued they'd be irreparably harmed if the tax went into effect early next year. The judge rejected that claim. Manufacturing companies around the state have been saying for some time that it's hard for them to fill open positions. A bill signed by Governor Murphy today could help. The bill would provide additional state funds matched by federal dollars to boost training programs around the state. Money would be spent on workforce development programs as well as programs to help veterans. Additionally, it would pay for the expansion of apprenticeship programs with a focus on Newark, Patterson and Trenton. Small businesses were in focus in Trenton today as the state Senate passed a bill that allows them some flexibility when it comes to dealing with state regulations. This bill would establish different compliance and reporting requirements for small businesses, which often don't have the financial resources to meet the kinds of deadlines imposed on larger businesses. The bill would simplify some of their regulatory requirements as long as public health and safety is not endangered. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. Two proposed rules may put New Jersey on a path to rejoin the multi-state regional greenhouse gas initiative it exited in 2012. One Department of Environmental Protection rule would establish mechanisms for rejoining REGI and set a cap on utilities' carbon dioxide emissions. The other would establish a framework for the way the state could spend money it makes from carbon dioxide allowance auctions. The DEP scheduled two public hearings at its headquarters next month. Written comments must be submitted by February 15th. 
That horrific Paramus school bus crash last May that left a student and a teacher dead has led to tougher laws that raise safety standards for buses and their operators. Governor Murphy signed into law a package of bills that require school bus operators comply with federal safety, noise emissions, insurance, and drug testing regulations, that drivers have safety training twice a year, and submit to annual medical exams. Drivers over the age of 70 must provide proof of physical fitness. In the final voting session of the year, state lawmakers did not get to weigh in on some marquee issues, but there were notable bills on the docket. Michael Hill's been tracking them. Big bipartisan changes are coming to New Jersey Transit. Lawmakers in both chambers approving bills to add one rail and one bus commuter to the agency's 13-member board, hold evening hearings, require the agency to submit two-year budgets, among several other changes. It was really an agency in crisis, so we started to build and uh, have come up with a great uh, transparency uh, and accountability piece of legislation in a bipartisan way that's going to put New Jersey Transit on the right track. We're actually having people who ride the rails every day and understand the problems that people are experiencing getting to and from the work and to and from their families and we need to make sure that we can have some changes that will happen real time have the right legislative oversight and also identify where the management problems can continue to be. The assembly approved several bills targeting hunger in New Jersey, discouraging food waste, preserving farmland and giving incentives such as alcohol licenses to grocers who would build stores in food deserts. Assemblyman Ryan Peters opposed the bill. You're saying we don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, so let's bring alcohol here um, in order to do that. Take that aside. Studies will show you that while, even though you're providing, for, providing fresh fruits and vegetables, um, people don't necessarily have the funds to come in and purchase them. Both Democrats and Republicans have sponsored a bill to restore a $20 million subsidy to the horse racing industry over five years to increase purses and undo what the former governor took away. What was the impact of taking away that subsidy by Governor Christie? Extraordinarily negative, and we saw it as the purses declined. We saw other states do better. The Senate also approved a bill to revise and broaden New Jersey's family leave law and a bill to form a commission to study wrongful convictions and recommend changes. The Assembly followed the Senate's March vote on a bill to have the state attorney general instead of county prosecutors investigate and prosecute cases of on-duty fatal police encounters. But in the last voting session of 2018, lawmakers will not get to vote on adult legalization of marijuana or the $15 minimum wage, largely because it seems Democrats can't agree on specifics. In Trenton, Michael Hill, NJTV News. Honoring a giant of civil and human rights. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Cape May, where biographies and manuscripts record Harriet Tubman spent time during the time she helped slaves escape to freedom on the Underground Railroad. Now members of the Macedonia Baptist Church, community businesses, and historical groups have signed a deal with a local developer to resurrect a decrepit old parsonage, parts of it dating back to 1799, and transform it into a museum in Tubman's honor. A church trustee's quoted as saying they hope to complete the project to coincide with the expected 2020 release of the new $20 bill that will enshrine Harriet Tubman's face on the front, bumping President Andrew Jackson to the back. Next to East Rutherford and a redecorating for back-to-back -back game days, immediately following the Jets' seven-point loss to the Houston Texans Saturday, ground crew scrambled to switch the arena colors from Jets green to Giants blue by Sunday. In choreography worthy of a court of ballet, every banner got swapped out, new advertising got hung up, even the swag shop souvenir garment racks pirouetted from green to blue in time for the Giants' crushing 17-zip defeat by the Tennessee Titans. And while the New York team struggles may have left New York fans seeing red, the games left New Jersey vendors in the pink. Finally, Jersey City and a settlement in the flap over the Port Authority's holiday decorations at the entrance to the Holland Tunnel. The placement of the O-shaped wreath over the O was just right, but instead of attaching the A-line shaped Christmas tree over the A, the A-shaped tree was put smack over the end. And that other wreath made tunnel tonal, evoking outcry from long-suffering commuters in the 
tunnel line. The Port Authority took a poll. More than 21,000 people weighed in, and the winner is moving the tree to the A and sending that second wreath to the Journal Square Pass station. And that's the Garden State Express for Monday, December 17th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Taxes, you're one in three quarters of a million, and the state's giving you a chance to pay up without penalty. Leah Mishkin reports. As the slogan goes, consider it a gift. No penalties, reduced interest on back taxes. Everyone is eligible except those that are under criminal investigation. The supervising investigator for the Division of Taxation says the outreach campaign sent out letters to over 750,000 people in the state. They've also been getting many calls and emails. In total, we've received over 40,000 telephone calls. To date, we have over 4,000 emails. We expect, and this is only halfway through, we expect a lot more to be coming in over the next uh, three, four weeks. This amnesty picks up where the last one ended. That means it applies to money owed on tax returns due on or after February 1st, 2009, and before September 1st, 2017. This is money that is due the state, and this is just a way to, to entice them to pay. Signs like this one have been placed on billboards and at train stations as part of an advertising campaign. There was a line item placed in the budget of uh, approximately $25 million. Um, some of that money is going to the advertising campaign. Uh, some of it will cover the over time necessary to process the returns and the payments. But the deputy director for the Division of Taxation says they anticipate collecting about $200 million, extra money to go into the budget for programs that are in need. So even though that's about a quarter of what the state estimates it's owed in back taxes eligible for amnesty. We will more than recoup any expense that's outlaid for this program. While the initial projections were unavailable, the Treasury Department says the amnesty program in 2009 collected $734 million, and the one before that in 2002 brought in $456 million. It, it gives you a chance to get the debt off your books, um, gives you a chance to get your returns filed and come into compliance. Uh, so that's the taxpayer end. A tax foundation spokesperson worries if you continue to offer tax amnesty. Taxpayers may take advantage of the rules because they know they'll get a chance to fix it down the line. Also, if you're using this to fill in a priority that's recurring, whether it's education or transportation, uh, then you're going to be left in the exact same situation in about, in about a year or two. So it's just a very temporary fix to try to, I guess you could say, kick the can down the road, so to speak. Right now, we're about halfway through the program. So mark your calendars, because if you don't pay up before January 15th, the state will tack on a 5% penalty. That's in addition to any other penalties and interests that have already piled up. In Trenton, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. New Jersey's 2009 tax amnesty brought in a record $734 million in revenue. Former Governor Christie withdrew New Jersey from the regional greenhouse gas initiative in 2012. 64% of NJ Transit's 2,730 employees who need positive train control training have received it. And the Burlington Pharmacy served as a meeting place for South Jersey abolitionists in the mid-1800s. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, sexual assault allegations still hang over the Murphy administration. Lawmakers hear from Murphy staffers. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow.
Independent College Fund of New Jersey, in partnership with Strategic Development Group, the Imagination Company, and its latest venture, Vibe, Newark's newest millennial address. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who keep the Garden State growing. Business leaders. The caretakers of our historic landmarks. And the custodians of our public safety. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM. We've got New Jersey covered. I'm fighting cancer. I'm fighting cancer. I am fighting cancer. I fight every day. Every night. Every hour. Every minute. And every, every second. second. RWJ Barnabas Health, together with the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, brings the latest research, treatments, and clinical trials close to home. We're fighting cancer. And I'm not fighting alone. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's beat cancer together.